recording. Okay, very good. Good afternoon, if you're in France, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, if you're in the United States, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. This is our second day of our French Ohio, France Ohio e-meeting uh, networking event. So we're very pleased to have you today. I just want to give you a little bit of uh, um, information about the event. This event uh, is recorded. And uh, that way, if you want to see the recording afterward or the people that are not able to join this morning, this afternoon, we'll be able to see it later. Um, second thing is uh, if you have questions, we welcome questions anytime, but please put them on the comment, uh, on the chat box on the side. And our guest speaker this morning will be pleased and happy to and so the question at the end uh, at the end of the presentation. We had a very busy day yesterday. We uh, we had Jobs Ohio that made a very comprehensive presentation about the state, the benefit, and all the the advantage of coming to Ohio. And we had the pleasure to also have a specific segment on aerospace with Ohio Aerospace Institute and Aerospace Valley based in Toulouse that help us monitor uh, that, uh, that dialogue. We also had the Genopole, which is a cluster based in France, interacting with our, with our specialist on uh, healthcare and biotech, a great segment on, uh, on, the, on the booming sector of, of healthcare. And then we had a, a testimonial from Safran, uh, a very large uh, company in the aerospace domain uh, that many of us know, but they're so large that it was great to hear their, their structure, their group, and also the testimonial of uh, Philippe, the CEO, uh, based uh, close to Cincinnati, about his experience about conducting business uh, in Ohio and in the United States. But today we are picking up for our second day with very pleased with four four speaker and the, basically the, the theme of this morning is how do I start business a business uh, in the United States? How I'm going to do that? So um, I'm very pleased to have uh, Isabel Vive Calignac, she's our honorary consul here in Cleveland in another part of Ohio. Uh, she's going to go up, around all the legal aspects. Uh, we're going to follow suit with uh, Joe Friday from uh, from uh, First uh, Merchant Bank, and he's going to explain to us how do we, you know, open an account to get going. And we have all our two tax experts, uh, Robert and Megan, that's going to tell us all the benefits of being in Ohio and uh, how to take advantage of it. So, without further ado, uh, I welcome our speaker, and uh, I will pass. Uh, uh, I will. I pass the talk to, to Isabel. Isabel, you're on. Merci, Cédric. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're in France. Bonjour. I'm Isabel Bibe Kalignac. I'm a business attorney based in Cleveland, Ohio. And yes, I am French. I speak French, and but French from France uh, because I've uh, become a joke here. People ask you. So I am. And uh, Today, I'm going to start uh, discussing some of the legal aspects. There are so many uh, with 15 minutes. It's going to be a little tough, but uh, we're going to start right at this moment. So um, we've prepared some uh, materials for you. They're available if you would like. Uh, some of them are extensive, but we wanted you to have them uh, because um, it's very important sometimes to just nail down the vocabulary because uh, the law is very precise and we wanna make sure that you have all that information. So America, the land of the American dream, everybody wants a piece of this market, but why we're here today and why there's a lawyer, myself on this panel is that America is not only the land of opportunity, but it is also the land of litigation. Litigation is a very big risk for all businesses, no matter in what domain you operate. So you wanna make sure you think about this as you structure 
uh, put together your business and maintain your business going forward. Insurance can help you, but it does not cover every situation, nor can you afford sometimes to um, uh, the insurance itself, but also to think about all the risks. So there are, it's not that difficult in the US to create a business. At times, um, it's more difficult to maintain it and uh, structure it the way, in a way to maximize returns for you, minimize risk, as well as uh, keep it going with also the relationship with perhaps some foreign entities located back in France. So uh, in the US, generally we have uh, the, the register where you would go and file for your entity. It's called the Secretary of State. That means that you have a Secretary of State in each of the 50 states. So um, you want to first register your entity there, and this is usually done online, uh, especially since COVID-19. It's not that expensive. The fees depend on the type of entity. And then once you have done that, you can go and obtain what we call an EIN number, an employer identification number. In the U.S., we function, we do not have um, uh, national I, um, in identification cards. But we do have, as individuals, a social security number, and that's used everywhere. So the employer identification number is the equivalent of a social security number, which has nothing to do um, with a French social security number, in a sense that it's not for healthcare, but it's your ID, and that's how your business is going to be recognized. The next step then is you need to open a bank account in the name of the business. You wanna make sure you do not commingle your personal funds with the funds of the business. This is uh, the same thing as you would have in France, of course. So uh, once you've selected uh, the jurisdiction and filed for your business, if you do business in other states, have employees in other states, have perhaps a plant in other states or some clients where you do regularly business, you are also going to need to register that entity in what we call foreign jurisdictions. And here I'm not talking about foreign overseas, I'm talking in a different state than the state where you have registered your business. So you need to do that with each state and then also register uh, to pay taxes in those states. So generally the level of taxation in the US is lower than in France, uh, but um, it, it's state to state. And uh, our friends from uh, Plank Moran and Jobs Ohio have done a great job at actually putting together a study that compares the different state taxations. And uh, this shows you that actually Ohio is, uh, is, is fares very well. So there are other types of registrations that are required. One is called the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. This is where uh, your workers would go and uh, get uh, coverage when there is an injury on the job. Um, employers are required to pay into that system. That's a state-based system. And that's um, for incidents um, during the job or on the workplace. And then uh, depending on what type of businesses you operate, you may need some permits and licenses. Um, but so that gets you started if you want. And then there are some ongoing filing requirements. And those again are state to state and they also depend on the type of entity we're talking about. So how they are various types of legal entities in the US and what's I would think my recommendation would be to not try to compare with what you have in your own country because that only is going to lead uh, to some wrong assumptions for you. So um, although we have uh, proprietorship, general partnerships, limited partnerships, corporations and limited li uh, liability companies or LLCs, the two that people focus on today are corporations and limited liability company. And the reason for that, um, so it's, keep, it's keep, keeping it simple really, and that's across all jurisdictions. You always have the choice between uh, being a corporation or a limited liability company. The, these two types of entities are going to isolate you from the risk, the liabilities. Um, now, whether you choose one or the other, um, it, all, it depends on some of the other factors. These could be uh, taxes. The way these two entities are taxed 
are different. They have different ta tax treatments. Uh, you can still make some elections in terms of tax treatments, but if you have any foreign ownership in the entity itself, that's going to uh, shut some doors, at least as an escort. There are a lot of legal ramifications, and then uh, they are also, how do you want to manage that? Um, the term uh, closely held company is often misunderstood, but uh, this discussion primarily will focus about what we call closely held companies. So these are companies that are not publicly traded, so uh, we're not going there. And that are, have um, definitely, we can have just one owner, but these are typically companies with uh, few owners, um, but it doesn't mean that they are small companies necessarily. So um, in terms of the differences between uh, uh, corporations and limited liabilities, as you can see, you have to also differentiate what is your legal entity versus your tax treatment. Um, corporations can uh, file as a C corp or corporation. And so a lot of lingo and a lot of acronyms also uh, that we deal with or as an S corp or S corporation. In terms of limited liability companies, they can be taxed as a proprietorship, partnership or S corp, but not if you have foreign owners and or as a C corp. So you can get the best of both worlds sometimes and um, but you have to make this selection at the onset when you file for your entity. It's not that easy and it will incur some uh, hurdles to switch from one status to the other. And uh, so you wanna um, get proper uh, counsel on that. In um, the US, we do not have uh, what we call in France, the notaire. You will often uh, hear the term notary in the United States, but it's not at all the same as a notaire. The functions that a notaire performs in France are actually performed by lawyers. So it means you not just you don't have just lawyers for litigation, but you also have lawyers as business lawyers a lot more than you do in France. So uh, and they are the ones who are going to be able to help you navigate through selecting the right type of entity, as well as putting together the documents that are necessary for you to uh, govern uh, your entity for big decisions, as well as from a day-to-day -day operations. In terms of the vocabulary, people tend to mix things up. So I'll start with corporations and corporations have shareholders. The shareholders are the owners of the business, whether small or, or, um, or, or large uh, in terms of percentage of equity into the corporation, but they're all called shareholders. Sometimes people will call them partners, et cetera, but the exact term is shareholders. To put together your corporation, you're going to want to file what we call articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State. And uh, that's fairly easy. You'll just have to um, get that organized. You can do that online. Um, your accountants can help you do that. There's no requirement in some states that it be done by a lawyer, but in some states it is. So then, um, and you need to not do this in sequence. Every, all this needs to be done um, together and before you start filing, you gotta think, unless you're the sole shareholder, you really need to think about how, what are the rules that are going to govern the operations and the management of the business? We put that in a document that are called the bylaws if you're dealing with a corporation. So the bylaws define all the rules in, for your corporation. If you do not have uh, all the rules in there, or if you don't have bylaws, period, and that happens, you then default to the state laws where your entity is incorporated. So to make things a little more complicated in some states like Ohio, uh, we use different terms. So bylaws are more called code of regulations, but we also have bylaws, but they just mean something else. So uh, we're just trying to keep you on your toes, but um, the keep lawyers busy, but uh, the, um, it seems uh, complicated from the outside, but business attorneys do this every day. The, uh, another um, tool in our arsenal to help uh, business owners is we have the ability 
to eliminate um, some of the, um, if you want, a framework uh, that come with having a corporation by making your corporation a closed corporation by entering into a closed corporation agreement. So usually what happens is the shareholders, which are the owners, elect the directors. The directors don't have to be the shareholders, but in a small business, they typically are. From there, the directors elect the officers that perform the day-to-day -day operations. If you want to eliminate the need for directors and therefore not have a board of directors, um, you can do that by uh, entering into a closed corporation agreement and keeping things a little more streamlined. Um, in the US, shareholders clearly have very, very limited liability. This is why people like corporations as well as limited liability companies. Basically what's at stake is your capital investment, uh, how much money you've put in there. Everything else, your personal assets, what's in your personal name is not at risk but there's always some exceptions. If you have commingled your uh, personal assets with your business, the um, regulators can go for what we call piercing the corporate veil and try to reach for your uh, personal assets. This is sometimes also the case when there are some fraudulent activities and uh, the government is trying to recoup um, money uh, to, um, distribute back to people that have been harmed by the actions of the corporations. Uh, the corporation, well, when the corporation decides to distribute its profits, we call that dividends. And uh, what you have to remember with a corporation is that it is a separate taxable entity apart from its owners. So that means that if you distribute dividends, that's going to be taxed and then the entity is going to be taxed. So both the shareholders receiving the dividends are going to be taxed as well as the corporation itself. Moving on quickly to limited liability companies is um, in terms of vocabulary. So same thing, you want to file for your company and we file by um sending articles of organization, not incorporation to the Secretary of State. And then the owners of a limited liability company are actually called members. So our firm, for example, is a limited liability company. And so therefore um, the term partner is not necessarily appropriate. We are called members. Um, so that's just a small distinction. In terms of uh, the document that you want to prepare and make sure you discuss with your partners and with your members and with your attorneys in terms of the rules, it's called an operating agreement, but um, some states or some people will also call it bylaws or a declaration. But again, these are the rules that define what's the majority, uh, super majority. Are there some events that need to be triggered with at least uh, minimum amount of vote or unanimous vote. Uh, that's the purpose of that document. Again, if you don't have that document in place, it's going to default to state law. Uh, the management can be done by your members or you can also elect managers. But uh, liability, same thing, pretty much. Um, you are only at risk for the capital that you have put in, in that entity. One difference about uh, corporations is they tend to have less reporting. So they will typically be uh, have lower cost uh, to administer and less paperwork to do. Um, the um, second, I think, most uh, important difference is um, profits are distributed as what we call distributions. And um, that's not taxed the same way for corporations. So you avoid that double taxation at that level but there are some reasons why you still may want to uh, use a corporation. The topic of uh, United States, we have 50 states. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, you can select where you want to file your entity. It's not because you operate in one state that you necessarily need to incorporate or file that entity in that state. Delaware seems to be the go-to um, jurisdiction nowadays. And the reason that is that it's very business friendly. 
As a result, though, because it's in high demand, the fees to file there are more expensive than anywhere else. Uh, some um, some corporate experts will argue that if you are a closely held corporation, there's really no need uh, to sh what we do what we call forum shopping. Forum shopping means you try to find the best jurisdiction for your entity. But I think many attorneys would um, uh, differ from that, and they would still um, still Delaware stands very strong. So you can file in one state and then register as a foreign entity in other states if you have operations in that state. And the whole purpose there is that you pay your taxes and your fair share there. So uh, in order also to register in that state, you need what we call a registered agent. Your registered agent is basically going to be uh, the go-to person to receive state notifications or notification of a lawsuit. So there's a lot of other things to cover here, but um, in the sake of time, I would put the slides together. It, human resources management is very, very different than in France. Um, generally, it's more liberal, but again, we're back to some uh, vocabularies and you'll need to understand what are benefits, what is at will employment. In the US, uh, it's a lot easier to hire and fire at will as your business needs fluctuate. There are some strict rules there and you may face uh, also some unions depending on what type of industries you're going to. There is also nowadays a strong sentiment to buy American. So uh, as you put together your entity and put together the team, although it may be absolutely necessary that you have people from the homeland uh, at the management level, think about also the value of having Americans on board so that they help you navigate the day-to-day -day management, but also uh, kind of help go through with the flow in terms of buy American. Buy American is not just um, something inherited from the Trump administration era. It's also some requirements and some contracts that you have uh, buy American content and sometimes uh, buying from a specific state content. This is true in transportations, notably with very large contracts um, in the transportation or rail industry. And then of course we have immigration. So I've listed other very critical legal areas you need to um, uh, have uh, expertise on or be counseled about before you choose. But remember, it's all about weighing the risks. And uh, so one thing at a time, but the less you think you try to make comparison with the French system, the easier it's going to be for you to assimilate these um, all these differences. So um, from there, and uh, as I talked about the need to have a bank account, we have on our panel a uh, banker. And Josh Riley from First Merchants Bank is going to tell you uh, how to do this. It's not an easy task. And for those of you that have already tried, uh, you know that it's not easy to open a banking relationship in the U.S. without traveling to the U.S. in person, and even then, uh, just to open it, uh, period. So, Josh, up to you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Thank you very much for the introduction, Isabel. Uh, let me pull my slides here. It's really appreciated. Let's see here. There we go. So good morning, everybody. Um, I've been working in the U.S. financial services industry for over 20 years. I've had the privilege of working for a diverse range of financial institutions that have given me a lot, uh, exposure to a large variety of transactions, services, and financial products. Today, I'd like to cover an overview of the U.S. banking system deposit accounts, and how to, how to access open accounts, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, account opening guidelines and document requirements, and a lending overview. In 2019, the U.S. banking system was comprised of 4,519 commercial banks. In addition, there are approximately 5,133 credit unions, 494 mutual banks, and 659 savings and loans. That's a lot of options. Um, I'm going to go over a brief definition of each. So 
There are retail and commercial banks that serve both consumers and businesses customers. These banks offer everything from mortgages to individuals as well as basic and complex services uh, to businesses to manage cash flow. Foreign exchange services are also available for companies to do business overseas. There are investment banks which help businesses raise capital when a company wants to go public or sell debt to investors. They may advise corporations on mergers and acquisitions. And of course, there are central banks, which manage the monetary system for the government. The Federal Reserve is the primary central bank of the United States. Then we have credit unions. Credit unions are nonprofit organizations owned by their customers. Their services are very similar to retail banks. We have online banks for entirely online, physical and more locations. We have mutual banks, which are cosmetically very similar to credit unions. They tend to be active, however, in a single community. And then we have savings and loans which offer consumer services to similar to retail banks. A little bit about First Merchants Bank. So First Merchants Bank is a commercial bank. They were organized during the Panic of 1893. Through a series of mergers and acquisitions over a 100-year timeline, the bank has grown over $14 billion in assets. It's now the second largest financial service holding company in the state of Indiana. We're very proud to make Fourth one of the top bank companies the fourth year in a row. And being headquartered in Midwest, the company's deeply rooted Midwestern values. We collectively feel that the work we do can grow businesses, strengthen communities, and improve lives. We believe the financial statements are just a snapshot, and as a banking partner, it's critically important we understand our customers and always strive to provide sound advice. We also believe in empowering our bankers to make the right decision on behalf of our customers. Our physical banking footprint includes Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. However, if you have accounts you need to access your funds in a different state outside of our footprint, we, along with the vast majority of the bank institutions out there, have multiple tools with which you can access your funds, and these include online banking, which is a way to have visibility regardless of where you are. Through your online interface, you can access bill pay, which is creating a payee from your account and sending payments either electronically or via U.S. mail. You also have the ability to move funds between commonly owned accounts. In addition to online banking, there are ATMs or automated teller machines. Most banking institutions will have a network which will provide a low or no-cost fee structure. However, funds can be accessed through any ATM. A bank check card or debit card. Now, these are issued at account opening and can be used to access funds within the account only. There's typically no charge to business or consumer for using these cards. But this is not to be confused with the credit card, which is a credit scored or underwritten debt vehicle which in most cases has a stated ceiling amount based on repayment capacity, credit scoring, and historical utilization of consumer or business trade lines. Outstanding principal balances on credit cards are charged interest ranging anywhere from 7 to 36 percent. To name a few additional access tools, we have wire services. Those are domestic and international. ACH, or automated clearinghouse services. This is a rapid form of money movement that is more secure than most and funds can be realized in the recipient's account on the same day. And then we have remote deposit capture, or RDC. This involves using desktop scanners to deposit checks into the bank institution without traveling to a physical location. Next, we're going to briefly cover types of depository accounts. So we have checking accounts, which allows for ultimately limited deposits, numerous withdrawals. These are liquid accounts that pay no or low interest rates. There's savings accounts, which are interest-bearing with some limitations on how the funds can be withdrawn, typically used for short-term deposits. We have a money market account, which is similar to a savings account, but typically are in a higher interest rate to include check writing and debit card access. And then we have certificates of deposit. So these provide an interest rate premium in exchange for the customer agreeing to leave a lump sum deposit untouched for a predetermined period of time. It's a conservative investment with a guaranteed rate of return, and panels may apply for early withdrawal. All these accounts are federally insured up to $250,000 based on ownership. Fee may apply based on services used and balances held and monthly statements sent by mail or free via electronic or online access. The next slide, we're going to cover the FDIC, or the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. The FDIC was established after the collapse of many American banks during the initial years of the Great Depression. Although earlier, state-sponsored plans insured depositors had not succeeded, the FDIC became a permanent government agency to the Banking Act of 1935. The FDIC is an independent agency of the U.S. government, and it protects depositors of insured banks located in the U.S. against the loss of their deposits if an insured bank fails. Any person or entity can have FDIC insurance coverage in an insured bank, 
and the person is not to be a U.S. citizen or resident to have his or her deposits insured by the FDIC. And again, the FDIC is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So on this slide, I've got some items with the FDIC covers. So we're looking at checking accounts, savings accounts, money market accounts, now accounts or negotiable orders of withdrawal, time deposits such as CDs. What the FDIC does not cover would be your stock investments, bond investments, so your E-Trade accounts, Merrill Lynch, um, mutual funds, any type of life insurance product, municipal securities, any contents in a safe deposit box, or U.S. Treasury bills, bonds, or notes. So let's stop here for a second. We can go over some ways in which one can maximize. Here's the next slide here maximize their um, FDIC coverage. So the standard deposit insurance is about 250 per depositor, and below you've got different types of ownership categories. And so with that being said, if you've got a joint account, so two individuals on account, you can actually achieve insurance up to $500,000. Now what's interesting is they have different caveats. So in some of these ownership categories, for instance, you have a payable on death, or also called an informal revocable trust, you can receive insurance up to $250,000 per beneficiary. So if there are four beneficiaries, the total amount of insurance would cover up to a million dollars. So next we're going to cover some account opening guidelines and documentation um, the banks are going to be looking for in the menu like a sponsor account. So typically for businesses, we're looking for a taxpayer identification number, a TIN. We're looking for registration through the Secretary of State in that given state. We're looking for an established physical location. Ideally, business would have a telephone number and a website for some form of third-party verification. The bank institution want to know what the estimated monthly recurring revenue is for the company. And they want to have an idea of the vendor's business and clients of the complete transactions with the company. And ultimately, every bank will have their own version of a CBO or Certificate of Beneficial Ownership form for individuals owning 25% or more. In a nutshell, what this form is, it just identifies who the controllers are of the company. In addition, all signers on a business account typically require valid personal identification, so driver's license, passport, et cetera. Um, a secondary form of ID, so credit card, birth certificate, social security card, we've even accepted library card before, um, a home address, telephone number, email, and job title. Um, each account will comply with OFAC, which is the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and essentially every financial institution will run an OFAC background on anyone applying for a new depository account. My next slide, we're going to cover lending. Um, so the vast majority of the commercial banks, SNLs, et cetera, will have a, a pretty wide range of consumer and personal loans. These can be anything from installment loans, for borrowers for purposes such as consolidating debt, financing, making big purchases, um, secured loans, these are backed by collateral, Typical, typically require full payment 12 to 60 months in equal installments. Unsecured loans, and these are these would fall in the range of student loans and credit cards. Um, typically lenders are going to require evidence of repayment copy and just by every one of these consumer loan products. Um, this may include anything from bank and investment statements recent tax returns, and proof of current employment. Mortgages are loans used to buy homes and other real estate with property held as collateral. Interest rates may be fixed or adjustable and are often financed for up to 30 years. A credit check will generally be run or determined also for eligibility. Um, and business loans. So these bullet points really targeted towards international companies headquartered outside of the U.S. Typically, we'll find appetite for established middle market-sized companies, the $50 million plus revenue size to corporate-sized entities, acquiring assets and domicile within the U.S. Um, First Merchants, for instance, is open to all industries, just looking for um, the collateral to be held here. Typically, interest rates would vary in range from the 10-year U.S. Treasury plus a margin of 175 to 500, 500 basis points, or 5%. Um, ideally, there's a U.S. headquartered accounting intermediary. Um, some other uh, services, again, that you're looking at for uh, as an offering at commercial retail banks, we need private wealth services, so retirement planning for individuals, and personal investment services. So as a, 
as a whole, First Merchants Bank doesn't currently have a go-to-market strategy. However, we're very interested in increasing our exposure to international companies. Um, we've had some terrific partnerships, uh, strategic partners such as McDonald Hopkins that have helped us with everything from accountant entity setup and translation services to legal advice needed. Um, so food for thought for those looking to pursue foster accounts. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, just, uh, yeah and then uh, Robert and Megan, you, you, you are next. Uh, just want to just mention quickly, I very appreciate uh, Josh, your presentation and Isabel, very comprehensive uh, highly technical topics, and I think uh, you know, Robert, you're gonna go over some other technical term, but that's this is why we we're doing that webinar to uh, to get our audience grounded on terms of uh, how to conduct business uh, in the U.S. So, Robert, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cedric, and bonjour. So, we formed an organization. We have a bank. Now we have to do some accounting and tax work. And that's what uh, I am here for, uh, Robert Shenton, uh, CPA, Certified Public Accountant with Plant Moran, uh, 30 years with the firm, over 30 years, uh, working in both audit, tax, and advisory services. And so Megan and I look forward to uh, sharing uh, a little bit more in terms of accounting and tax issues that may, you may run into as you set up an entity in the United States. Megan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Robert. My name is Megan Malone. I'm 13, 14 years with Plant Moran. I'm also a CPA. I'm located in the Cleveland office along with Robert and happy to share some tax information. I think that's everyone's favorite topic. So I'll do that to close up the session today. Okay, we're going to share the screen here and uh, assuming the slides are up and ready to go. Perfect. Go, go to slide two here. So where we're gonna start is the different types of accounting positions in firms. And so there's generally three levels that we see within companies in the United States that starts with an accountant or bookkeeper. And these positions generally take care of accounts payable, take care of payroll, take care of collecting accounts receivable and doing the general journal entries that are part of your books and records. The next level is the controller. And as a controller, that person really is responsible for doing some of the supervision of the financial reporting, the financial statements, and analysis of those financial statements in terms of trends or activities uh, with, your, with your business organization. The third level is a chief financial officer. And that generally is someone who's overseeing far more than just the accounting, but responsible for setting financial strategy, uh, financial analysis, mergers and acquisitions, and things that really help your company to grow, whether it's at an accelerated rate or a moderate rate of growth. The degree to which you need a chief financial officer, a controller or accountant or bookkeeper really depends on the size and complexity of your business. And one of the key things to understand is that that can be accomplished either by having those individuals within your company or outsourced. There are a number of firms that, that provide outsourced accounting services uh, for your accounting and financial reporting needs. And then in addition to that, there's a number of different accounting firms in the United States that provide the audit and tax and consulting services. And your legal documents, as Isabel mentioned, uh, may indicate what type of financial statement reporting you need. The banks may have certain requirements for audited financial statements or reviewed financial statements. But one of the things we would certainly recommend that if you are doing business internationally, make sure that you're working with a firm that understands international business issues, understands the differences in accounting and tax systems and financial reporting so that you can navigate some of those key issues and not find yourself in some difficult situations with fines and penalties. What I'd also like to indicate from a Plant Moran perspective is that while we would be the 11th largest firm in the United States, uh, for those of you in France, you may be familiar with the firm Mazars. And Plant Moran is part of the Mazars North American Alliance, uh, which represents five of the largest firms, Plant Moran being one of them. So we do have a strong understanding between not only what happens in the United States and in the Midwest, but also what happens in Europe and France. Uh, 
All right, on to some main U.S. business taxes. So high level, I'm going to talk through some of the taxes that you'll come across here in the United States. First off, income taxes in the United States are at the federal, state, and local levels. How an entity is taxed is dependent on the type of entity the company is for tax purposes. So I'll piggyback off of something Isabel said earlier. The most common types we see for foreign inbound companies would be the USC Corp or the US LLC. Here I've listed three different types of entities, the corporation, LLC, and partnership. Corporations, income for corporations is, are taxed at, is taxed at 21%. A US LLC or partnership is considered a pass-through or flow-through entity. The income from the company passes through to the owner and is taxed at the owner level. As Isabel mentioned, there are different elections that can be made. So for instance, the US LLC has an option to be treated as a flow-through or a C corporation. The default treatment of a US LLC is a flow-through. So if you would like to be treated as a corporation, you have to take action by filing a check the box election. Partnerships have a very complex structure and, and complex rules when foreign partners are involved. And that is not a common structure that we would see for foreign inbound companies. Moving on to states and local income tax, states may also impose, impose tax on any type of entity as long as that entity has nexus or a taxable connection with that state. There is little uniformity between the states, unfortunately, regarding taxability. Therefore, the tax rate, income modifications, income apportionment, and different filing positions may vary. Ohio does not impose a direct income tax on C corporations. However, they do have a commercial activity tax, which I will touch on on the next slide. Comparatively, surrounding states such as Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, they do have income taxes for state, uh, at the state level, anywhere from five to 10%. And Ohio cities do impose a tax on net profits, but that is based on the city. On this slide, we'll cover sales tax, withholding tax, and a few other taxes. Most people are familiar with the value added or goods and services tax. However, the US does not impose these types of taxes. Instead, states and local jurisdictions impose a sales and or use tax on the sale of tangible personal property and select services. There are typically exemptions that may apply, such as a manufacturing exemption, but proper documentation must be in place to take this exemption. Ohio's current sales and use rates, tax rate is 5.75%. Foreign persons or entities that are, are generally subject to 30% tax in the form of a withholding tax on certain US source income, such as interest, dividends, and royalties. This tax rate may be reduced by a tax treaty between the US and the country of the recipient. Proper documentation must also be in place for this reduced rate in the form of a W-8. W-8s come in many different forms depending on the entity or the individual. This form is not filed with the government. However, it should be kept on file with the withholding agent. There are forms that are filed with the government that come in the form of a 1042. The forms provide the type of payment, the amount of payment, and also the amount of withholding for the government and the recipient. A couple other taxes to talk about, payroll. So there are different, um, very different requirements regarding payroll taxes dependent on whether or not the individual is an employee or an independent contractor. Compensation paid to an employee is generally subject to federal income tax withholding, social security tax, Medicare tax, federal unemployment tax, such as Isabel mentioned earlier. Employers must withhold and make timely deposits and filings quarterly and annually. In addition to the federal payroll taxes, states may also impose similar taxes um, on payroll. Due to the complexities with payroll, 
we typically recommend working directly with a payroll provider who assists not only with the calculations, but sometimes the remittance of payroll taxes on behalf of the company. If an individual is not considered an employee, but rather an independent contractor, the payroll tax obligations lessen significantly. Annual statements of compensation made to an individual are still required in the form of a 1099 versus a W-2 that is provided to the employee. These forms assist that individual with filing their own individual federal, state, and local taxes. The commercial activity tax is an annual tax imposed on the privilege of doing business in Ohio. So as I mentioned earlier, Ohio does not have a direct income tax on C corporations. The commercial activity tax is imposed on all types of entities that have more than 150,000 in gross receipts. The research and development credit, if generated in Ohio, can be used to offset this tax. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that credit in, in a second here. The tax rate is 0.26% for the commercial activity tax. And, and Megan, I would say on that too, I think it's a very user-friendly tax. So it's very easy to complete. It's very easy to calculate. And one of the reasons why Ohio is a competitive state for business location on that state tax and commercial activity tax situation. I would completely agree, Robert. Um, very easy. Everything is done online. Um, it's just very user friendly. So moving on to some compliance basics. This slide covers the, the basics, lists the forms and due dates of the returns for the entities discussed earlier. Note that the due dates can vary state by state. Sometimes they're the same as federal. However, sometimes you'll find that they're a month later. Also note that quarterly estimates of income taxes are due at all levels, federal, state, and local. Next on to credits and incentives. Who doesn't like credits and incentives? Let's reduce that tax. So the first one here I wanted to mention, research and development. This is a credit available to companies that incur qualified research expenses, such as salaries, supplies, contract research, to improve products, processes, or even software in the United States. There are both federal and state tax saving opportunities when it comes to this credit. This is a dollar for dollar tax savings and can be carried back one year or forward 20. So even if the company is in a lost position, it may be beneficial to look into taking this credit in order to carry it forward to future years. Other incentives that I list here have to do with fixed assets or pro property placed in service uh, for the use in the business. Section 179 allows taxpayers to expense the cost of certain tangible property placed in service in the taxable year. This expensing election does come with income limitations and phase outs. So due to the limitations and phase outs, bonus depreciation seems to be pretty popular. Certain new and used property acquired and placed in service before January 1st, 2023 can, be, can take 100% tax depreciation upfront immediately. So you do not have to depreciate that property over the life of the asset. This is an accelerated deduction that you can take for tax purposes. And that accelerated deduction is set to be reduced starting after January 1st, 2023 by 20% each year. So for example, for calendar year 2023, the rate would be 80%. Moving on to the interest deduction limitation, this would be very important for companies with third party or intercompany debt. In general, the limitation applies to all business interests, whether the interest is paid to a foreign or US person or entity. The disallowed business interest expense deduction can be carried forward indefinitely. Foreign tax credits. In the US, as in many other countries, if you pay foreign tax on income, there is usually an opportunity to take a credit against the US tax. A separate calculation, of course, must be done. Transfer pricing, as most know, this is to prevent avoid tax avoidance um, and govern how related parties set pricing within intercompany transactions. In general, 
the intercompany pricing must meet an arm's length test, meaning that the same transaction, if it occurred with unrelated taxpayers, would have the same pricing or similar pricing. I wanted to quickly mention that there are special rules related to ownership and disposal of US real property under FERPTA. This applies when a foreign entity or individual disposes of US real property, generally requiring a 15% withholding on the gross proceeds. Although there may be exceptions that apply and that would be something that would have specific facts and circumstances to look into. Guilty or the global intangible low tax income is a new way to tax foreign subsidiaries of US companies. Income of foreign subsidiaries is taxed regardless of the repatriation to the US. This came into play with the new tax reform a few years ago and continues to be a calculation done on the US tax return. FIDI or foreign derived intangible income is a US tax incentive for US C corporations. If a US C corporation has foreign sales or earns service income outside of the US, there may be a, um, a, a tax incentive or um, a lower tax rate to apply to this income. And again, that is for USC corporations. With that, I will pass it back to Robert and he's gonna talk a little bit about Plant Moran, Team Neo and Jobs Ohio and what we do together. Thank you, Megan. And a, an important part of wrapping this up is really understanding a word called collaboration. It's important that your legal team, your banking team, and your accounting team all have the right expertise and the ability to collaborate and work together. And similar to, as I mentioned, Plant Moran being part of an alliance with Mazars, Plant Moran, McDonald Hopkins, First Merchants are all part of Team Neo, which is Northeastern Ohio, as well as part of the Jobs Ohio Network. And that collaboration really provides a lot of, we'll say, incentives and information to help organizations that you may be considering coming to the United States, coming to Ohio, Northeast Ohio to organize an entity. And that's where the firms that you're hearing from today, as well as Team Neo and Jobs Ohio can be very effective. And specifically in the industries we've been focused on of healthcare, advanced manufacturing and aerospace. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present today and uh, we'd be happy to uh, stop now and take any questions. And I'll stop screen sharing here. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks. Thank you, all of you, our, our panelists today. It was a very comprehensive. I'm going to also pause the recording. I think uh, as people review that later on, they're going to really get a good sense on uh, what what needs to be done and that they can rely on you and our network uh, to move forward. So.